So my name is Jonathan Sassini, and I wrote the essential Bernie Sanders and his vision for America. And uh, actually, at the end, if you want to buy a book, I'll sign it as well. I've got some books. Um, I, I just want to say basically a few things about the book and about where we are uh, in the campaign and what this campaign is about. Um, I consider it the greatest privilege in my adult lifetime. I've been in politics for all my life, actually, since I was a teenager. I'm 59 now, so that's giving you some context of having been in a comedy campaign since I was a teenager. Worked on campaigns when I was leafleting. Actually, I remember when I, when I was a kid, I dragged my mother um, to help me distribute leaflets for this really left-wing, crazy radical organization called the Sierra Club which at the time was considered this really radical thing, you know, when they were talking about Earth Day and things like that, the Sierra Club was radical. Now it's quite a mainstream organization. And I have never been as excited about a campaign and the possibility of a campaign as I have with Bernie Sanders. And the reason is a, a couple of four. One is I, I know the guy. And <coughs> what I write in the book in the beginning is he's the most authentic politician I ever met and had the privilege of working with and for. And I've known a lot of politicians, and I include those people who are what I would consider to be progressives. You know, people who actually have pretty good politics. Some of them are, I've known for a long time. The mayor of New York, some of you know Bill de Blasio. We go back about 25 years. We worked together as young whippersnappers in the first campaign for David Dinkins when he ran as the first African American to be mayor of New York. Um, do, you need to, do you need to wire me up for that? Okay. Um, is it already wired so that the mm -hmm. thing's working? It's on. Okay. So, um, and, and Bill is a good guy on the, on the policy level, but everybody, including him, has a certain amount of bullshit that they put out, you know, even the good ones. It's something like something gets triggered and they give slogans and they talk. Bernie's not that way. The same guy who you see <coughs> speaking to 20,000 people is the same guy who, if you're sitting here talking to you one-on-one, -on -one, you'll be saying the exact same things with the same passion and the same belief in what he's talking about. Because what he talks about, and I say that I know that there are people who know this about Bernie, maybe there are people who came to find out a little bit more about him. His principles, and we had a little video of it briefly up about showing him saying these things back in the 80s, the things he talks about now, and his beliefs are the same things he's been saying for 30 and 40 years. <coughs> the basic principles. Now, circumstances have changed. ISIS didn't exist back in 1980. The Koch brothers didn't exist. Oh, they were probably alive, but they didn't exist in the way we know them now, trying to rob our entire country and control it and buy elections. But Bernie's principles have not changed. And I think that's a part of one of the key things that has captivated the country and drawn a tremendous amount of people to this campaign, and particularly young people, uh, I guess the so-called millennials. Although I was asked this question today, I did an event at uh, UPenn earlier. Why is it that millennials love it? Well, I actually think that I've been around the country in Florida, uh, Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, California, Oregon, on and on. I see lots of people coming to I mean, I, I've met a woman named Terry in Florida who's a, in her 60s. She was a lifelong Republican, and so she, the party abandoned her, essentially, and now she's a complete Bernie fan, has been doing an enormous amount of volunteering for him. So there's all sorts of people who are engaged in the campaign. I think younger people, first of all, like to go to rallies, and so they, I think there's a tremendous flocking of younger people to rallies. Who doesn't like to be, it's like a mosh pit, right? get to go in, you're, you're with your friends, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting. But I, I do think there's no question that um, younger people are being drawn to it, and partly because of authenticity. And I was interviewed by, by you guys before, and that's what I say on, on, on the camera. His authenticity is incredible, and it's really connected with people. And the second thing that I would say in, in, in knowing Bernie is that Three years ago, when I talked to him at length, I, did, I interviewed him for Playboy magazine. And I talked to him at length, and one of the things I said to him, Bernie, this is your time. Come on, man. Everything you're talking about, the rich getting richer, <coughs> the banks taking over, the financial crisis, everything you're talking about is happening now. This is your time to, to run for president. And he 
has said basically that, number one, very few people of his time, being democratic socialist, get to be where he is, a United States senator. And the second thing he said is, you know, I don't wake up with this burning desire to be president, but he did say that he was convinced that he was where the majority of Americans were on the issue. And that stuck with me three years later. I thought about what he had said back then. He was convinced that the majority of people support expanding Social Security. The majority of people say we should break up the big banks. The majority of people think we should have free health care. And since I'm at a college, uh, the majority of people think it's a great idea we had tuition-free college, where people didn't leave with these huge, 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 I can't quite mimic it, huge uh, student debts that burden them when they enter into their work life. He was convinced that he was where the majority of Americans were. And I say that because I think that that's what eventually led him to decide to run for president. That when it came down to it, after all the conversations, he said, I think I can win this. And he was very clear that he was getting into the race because he thought he could win, not just to make a point. He thought he could convince the majority of Americans to join this political revolution. Now, in this book, all just by the, as an aside, it's 95% his words. Because what I wanted to do is create an organizing handbook so that people could actually read what he has actually said. It's almost not very little about me or my for me. So it's divided by chapters. You have a chapter on Wall Street, every page, every chapter is about two or three pages. You can read it, put it aside, and never look at it again. It was designed to pass along to people his actual words so people could get to know where he stood. And my favorite thing is when I travel around the country is to meet people who bought the book and it's all coffee stained, you know, bent and pages are folded over because I feel like people are actually making the use of the book in the way I envisioned it. <coughs> to actually help people understand and make the argument for Bernie and convince people why they should join this political revolution. Um, I think that we are in a moment in time, and in particular with Bernie running, that this election, you've probably heard this, this uh, saying before, this is post, most election, the most important election in your lifetime. Have you heard that? Has anybody said, this is the most important election in your lifetime? You've heard that, right? But I've never believed that. Because I've always felt that every single election Every single election, and I could go, we could go through every election, just take 2000. If George W. Bush had not been elected president, or if the Supreme Court of the United States had not handed him the election, because Al Gore actually got more votes than George Bush, think of how many Iraqis would be alive today. Think of the three or four or five trillion dollars that would not have been spent on that war that we could have spent on, you know, we could all come up with a list of things we care about. So that election matters. What I do want to say about this election is I think that this is an election of great opportunity. <coughs> That's the way I talk about this election. It's an opportunity that may never come back to us. Because what's happened is two streams. You've got this man, Bernie Sanders, who has electrified people and has really connected with people and has crisscrossed the country. And as he becomes more known, more people flock to his campaign. And at the same time, you've got all these crises, right? collapse of the economy, which happened just a few years ago, which put millions of people out of work, uh, cratered the economy, which we really have not recovered from. Wages going down, the greatest inequality in my lifetime, certainly, and probably going back 50, 60 years. All these things have come together that if we seize this moment of this incredible energy, we can really change the country, and we can really change our future. And I think if we don't capture this, the status quo is just going to keep doing what the status quo does. And we can't afford that. We actually cannot afford that uh, in a concrete le uh, way. People don't have work. People aren't making a living. People's pensions are going away. And those of you, I think we all care about climate change. I'm trying to manipulate this slide here so it goes over here. We just don't have the time to, you know, futz around. I was going to use a different word, but, you know, futz around with work. We have to actually address these things head on. Bernie's the only guy that is willing to do that, to take on the status quo. Now, 
He talks, and he has talked in the, in the book, but he talks everywhere. I know you've heard these speeches about the political revolution. And here's what, to me, the political revolution means. He's very, you know, Bernie is a very um, successful politician. And so it's not just pie in the sky. Behind the idea of the political revolution are some very, very concrete things. So let's say he's, when he's elected, President of the United States, and he's inaugurated on January 20th, 2017. Now, I firmly believe that's going to happen. I believe he's going to be the nominee, and I believe he will win the general election. He is going to face a hostile Congress. And he's going to face a hostile Congress even if it's a Democratic candidate. Right? Let's be very clear. That there's no question, and I hope I'm not um, uh, insulting anybody here in this room, there's no question that the Republican Party has gone off the rails. And it's really kind of wacky. And will oppose everything that Bernie would love to do. But let's face it, there's a lot of opposition in the Democratic Party to many of the things that we want to do. Most Democrats do not support the idea of a $15 minimum wage. They want to do something much lower. Most Democrats are not necessarily in favor of breaking up the big banks. They may talk a good game, but actually they're getting a ton of money from Wall Street and campaign contributions. Most Demo uh, I shouldn't say most, a significant number of Democrats still support bad trade agreements, like Na NAFTA type agreements that Bernie has opposed from the beginning that Hillary Clinton has, has, um, has support that Bernie has opposed and Hillary Clinton has supported. So we're gonna have a big struggle, first of all, with Democrats. So here's what political revolution means very concretely. In the midterm election in 2018, we're gonna have to actually go after, in a very concrete, methodical way, and unelect people that shouldn't be in Congress, and elect people like people sitting here. Activists, real people who want to change the country. And the beauty about this is that if I had told you this, and I had said this maybe a year ago, you would have said, yeah, fine. Where are you gonna find the money? And the most, one of the exciting things to me about this campaign is, you know, Bernie has found the key to unlock the question of how we raise money, right? What's the average contribution that people contributed? Come on, louder. Of course. It's like when, when he says that, and if, if you were there probably last night, how many people went to rally last night? Did he ask that question, and did the whole crowd answer it in unison? He usually does, and he loves that. He always smiles. And the average contribution is what? <laughs> and everybody says, in unison, $27. And the, the important part about that is that he's raised tens of millions of dollars. That was the only, I had a question about whether we could raise the money and whether we could last. We raised more money than the political, one of the most powerful political machines in American history. <laughs> Forget the super PAC for the status quo campaign. But in the last quarter, we raised more money. We, the people, raised more money to have Bernie's pack. And these political reporters often laugh about this. They've never seen a situation where people donate more money when their candidate loses. It's extraordinary. Because our reaction has been that we're part of this movement and that when Bernie doesn't win a state, we have to give him more money so we can do better. Normally what happens when you lose, people are like bandwagon. You know, they jump off and they say, I'm going to save my money. But each time we, certainly when we win, but even when we have a close loss, cut, he raises $2 million the next couple of days. It's, it's just unbelievable. And I think we need to understand how important that is in terms of the political revolution and our ability to be very concrete about going out and electing people in 2018 who will support our agenda. We can do this. <laughs> if you had said this to me, if you had asked this question of me a year ago, I'd say, no way, cannot happen. I ran for office myself and I could not raise enough money. Most insurgent candidates don't have two nickels to rub together. It's always very, very difficult. So um, I want to pause there and I want to introduce Jan and let him do his thing. I'm going to come back and talk some more about this and then take a lot of questions. So keep your questions, and then I'm gonna let them take over, and I'm gonna go off and do my little thing, and I come back. So you guys uh, filibuster for me. Don't go away.
We'll tell you right back. Congratulations, guys, like uh, OTA champs. Yeah, we're really, very good. Very good. Okay, so, so uh, can I start? Yes, yes. Okay, so my name is Carol. I am running as a delegate uh, pledged to Bernie Sanders uh, in the second congressional uh, district. Um, I also have a day job. I'm a physician. I practice at Penn Medicine at Radnor, which is just right down the road from me here. Um, and so, uh, that's a pretty busy day job, so why am I running to uh, support Bernie Sanders, um, you know, who's been, at least in the past, regarded as sort of a fringe candidate, and who's promising health care for all, which some people say is a kind of a pie in the sky concept. So just briefly, um, as a physician, um, you know, the, the impact of uninsured people who get sick, go to emergency rooms, and, and pr disproportionately, like, die, uh, because they don't have access to the proper care, you know, is, is a really pressing concern. It's not just a story, it's actually a, a, a reality. Uh, the idea that people cannot afford their medicines, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, serious reality that, um, that I see in my work and just as a human being, I, I find that to be not an acceptable situation. Um, and so Obamacare has actually made a lot of progress in remove some of the worst abuses of the health insurance companies, like the pre-existing condition clause, like if you're a cancer patient and you lose your insurance and you have to get new insurance, the new insurance will cover you for everything except your cancer care. Well, right, it's ridiculous. Um, so, so those really egregious areas of the healthcare uh, you know, system were, were helped by Obamacare, but we still have private for-profit insurance companies got to cover basic preventive care. So he shut the door on certain practices of the health insurance companies, and they promptly like opened the window. And so now, you know, we're seeing, they, now there are other things that they don't cover. And so I don't know if any of you know about your health insurance plans, or your parents have health insurance plans that are high deductible plans, and they're paying thousands of dollars out of pocket. That's a new thing that's happened since Obamacare. And it's because we still have for profit so that's just a quick vignette on you know, like why do I care about uh, Bernie Sanders. So Bernie Sanders has been supporting, Bernie Sanders calls himself a democratic socialist, right? And we're like, what is that? So I think that Bernie's concept is that our government has a basic responsibility to provide the citizens of our country with certain basic, meet certain basic needs and not to leave everything open to the free market where you're kind of you're on your own. Um, and so that has been Bernie's commitment through his entire really, really lengthy career. And, and healthcare for all has always been kind of a, a part of, of what he has stood for. Um, and I do quickly address the electability part. Um, you have to understand it's all about the money and politics, right? And millions of dollars are spent on political so here's a political campaign that's raising approximately like $45 million a month in $27 increments across this country. So what does that tell you about his support across the nation? It's one of those kind of like do the math, right? So the mainstream media may be telling you that, oh, you know, he's a fringe, it's a flash in the pan, he's not electable. You have to look at what's going on. You have to really see that when that many people are just digging into their pocket month after month, just ordinary people, working class people, that indicates a very significant amount of grassroots support. And that's what we see, like when Bernie, like yesterday, I don't know, was anybody at the rally at Temple yesterday? Yes. Were there a lot of people there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there were like, I think, I mean the, the Lee Forest Center holds 10,200 people, it was full, and there was another little basketball arena that was also, okay, so over 12,000 people. It just kind of showed up for, for Bernie Sanders. So that's my shtick. And uh, I'm going to talk yeah. a little more about volunteering. Yeah, so I think Jonathan stopped off at a good place um, with his talk. 
talking about political revolution. Um, I don't want to be presumptuous here. Uh, I don't expect everyone to necessarily be a Bernie Sanders supporter, but um, how many of you know that you support Bernie Sanders for president? Cool. So, so it's some of you. It's not all of you. Um, I think the, the key here, and so how, how many of you have, have done any sort of volunteering uh, for Bernie Sanders? Cool. Um, the point of this campaign is that it's a people's campaign. Um, I've been by some of the staff offices here in Philadelphia, and um, the number of field staff here are a handful. Um, and that's it's just kind of the nature of the way this works, um, because the way this thing gets carried out is by people like us um, actually taking some control, taking some initiative, and moving forward with this. Um, and so there are a few key ways that you can do that. Um, one of them is phone banking. Um, and I think a really important thing to do on a university campus like this is to, uh, to have a student group together, to have regular phone banking sessions. Um, and the campaign's made it really easy to do this, uh, berniesanders.com slash phone bank. Um, and uh, you know, phone banking has been shown to have a pretty, pretty significant effect on, uh, on voter turnout. especially here on the ground in Pennsylvania, is canvassing. Um, it might seem like it's a step up from phone banking. I've done both of them. Um, I actually find canvassing to be easier. Um, uh, and, and that's something that you can do by getting plugged into the campaign. Um, there are various offices where they're uh, uh, doing canvassing every weekend and in some places uh, weekday nights as well. Um, and the last thing is get out the vote. So um, you on a college campus, constitute a, a lot of voters, and a lot of uh, voters have been supporting Bernie Sanders. Um, so it's important to kind of mobilize a, uh, a get out the vote effort um, to make sure that everybody actually does make it to the polls. In some cases, the polls might not be uh, super convenient for you to get to. So that's not how it works here exactly, but um, I know in some schools in this area, um, it's, it's inconvenient to get to polls. Um, and so uh, mobilizing people to actually get out the vote is pretty important. So uh, that's, that's my spiel on, on activism. Can we take some questions? So we have a question about like, where does Bernie stand on particular issues or?
means that you need to elect people like Bernie on local level, you know, could be municipality and the you know the how the state legislature, you know, just work your way up, starting at a grassroots level, a political revolution, you're trying to elect people like Bernie everywhere. Get him get him support in the in the Congress in Congress, get him support everywhere around around the nation, governors, you know, senators, what, whatever he needs. I, I just I think and then getting people involved in the political process as well. Um, that's that's what I think. Anyone else want to jump in? One of the things that I found kind of shocking, well not shocking, it's definitely what he's been running on, it's what uh, a lot of his Democratic policies are on, is increasing the minimum wage. Um, and I understand all the, the negative, like the negative reasons why they shouldn't do that. I mean, they've tried it in certain parts of the country and it turned out that a lot of restaurants closed or uh, in inflation rates or um, companies might begin outsourcing in other countries or small businesses might not be able to handle it, et cetera. What are the reasons for it other than putting more monies into the pockets of Americans so that they can spend it? What, what, 
and, and giving others an opportunity, obviously, by like when everything, if, if they have to increase minimum wage, wouldn't the price of their commodities then increase as well? So therefore, wouldn't really nothing happen except inflation? Right, so there's, there are a lot of different things bundled into that one right. question. First of all, we're gonna find out, right, because Seattle, Washington, there are these places around the country, some people in California, in California they've right. enacted the, the $15 minimum wage, right. and we'll see what happens. So certainly, a small business owner who has to suddenly possibly even like double the hourly wage of their employees, that may create a financial, there's no question, mm -hmm. could create a financial burden. But the thing that I think is important to understand is that sometimes our economy is built on kind of false economies. And you mentioned like they might outsource their work overseas. That's happening a lot and it is, it's because there are trade agreements that are favorable to corporations that allow them to send that work overseas and, and pay people really much less, right? I mean, there's people in other countries that are earning, you know, cents an hour, three dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is part of this idea that your, your government, like as a citizen of this country, we're an affluent country, we should not have people laboring away at two jobs and you know, like if you were a a, wait, a a server in a restaurant, right, earning two dollars and fifty cents an hour, you know, because you're going to make it up on tips. That's not a living wage. And then that person, even though they're working eight hours a day or more, is still, you know, can't buy a home, can't send their kids to school. So so there are sacrifices involved in giving somebody a living wage. But it's an ethos or a culture that says we're United States citizens and we all want to have a certain floor or a certain, you know, livable, you know, if you're an honest working person, you should be making enough to support your family uh, and, and not have to have uh, two or three jobs, which is a reality for a lot of people. Um, so I'm not sure if I yeah, answered your well question. Well, I'd just like to add to that. Right. You know what Bernie said to me, you want a Denmark there. What do you make of living in Denmark? You know, very nice life, lifestyle over there. You know, they have free tuition, they have public health care, they have a huge, I, I think McDonald's over there has to pay $20 an hour. Things are good for people. They don't, you don't have people starving in certain areas of their city or forgotten and kind of drugged out. They just don't have that. And yet, they're doing anything, you know, the, the amount of money they generate over a year is much less than the United States or even per capita. Well, here, we have far greater per capita GDP, and what are we doing with it? Uh, you know, going to the top 1.1% or going to Lord or going to other you know, corporations or offshore tax shelters and things like that. And um, so, you know, it's, it's not impossible because all of Western Europe has all these things. Why don't we? What as as Bernie is really fond of pointing out, like, the, the Walton family of Walmart could afford to pay their workers more, so their workers don't have to be on food stamps. I mean, so there are you know examples that you can point to where it's just obvious. And the thing about tuition, when I was in school way many 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 years ago, I wasn't paid anything. Our country had far less wealth, far less wealth. You know what the difference was? The corporations were paying a lot more, and the tax on the super super wealthy were a lot more uh, were a lot higher, and so that money state governments, went into city governments, but it went to the federal government to fund education and programs that were good for everybody. <coughs> why, why do this again? You know, it's everywhere but here. It's poor and, you know, impoverished third world countries that you know, do the dictating and things like that. But this is what we do. This is an out, it's really outrageous. I think you talk about Denmark and also talk about the United States. I think, you know, um, if you look at what the minimum wage was in, I think, the 70s or the 60s, Look at how that tracks with inflation and with uh, productivity. That's how they get the numbers. <coughs> the numbers just seem to just come out of nowhere. Uh, so that's where that comes from. Um, and it does differ in different parts of the country what it takes to live. You know, they do calculate in some basic cost of living. Um, and in some places, um, it's, it's down to like 13 or something like that. So, you know, maybe you can get by on less there. But overall, if you were to have a national floor, that's the logic behind that. The other thing to 
slowly that spread, San Francisco, Los Angeles, now the whole state of California, the whole state of New York um, have committed to reaching that eventually. Um, but the fight for that did not start in, in like the political, elected politicians' world. It started with fast food workers and other minimum wage workers standing up. And this took years. It was the, the coup was kind of support. Um, and you know, they started getting the support. People were not. So that's how you gain the base to actually create a change that seems ridiculous years before. Um, and it's going to require something like that for almost every issue that Bernie Sanders is pushing on, which is why he says electing him president is not going to be, you know, that's not going to make it happen. I think what's happened with Bernie is that a national discussion has started, which is really different than anything that we've had in the past. And so it, it's true that these But there's a heightened level of, of awareness of these issues, and people are not embarrassed to say, you know, I'm going to stand with the, the McDonald's worker, you know, rather than having an attitude of, oh, they must not have played their cards right, and you know, they wound up in the circumstance that they they deserve. And I think that this articulation of this I, I thing of being a, a revolution, you're a little kind of shy to say because it sounds kind of radical, but the idea, but the fact that Sanders is articulating. We kicked the ass. states 
It does matter if the contest is, say, 55 to 45 versus 70 to 30. If it's 55 to 45 under Democratic Party rule, there's very little difference in the allocation of delegates. The winner might get a couple or three more delegates. But if you expand out to 70 30, then the winner gets a bigger share because it's proportional. And so after March 15th, what happened was we then entered into terrain that was much more favorable to Bernie. States that were more progressive, states where Bernie could make the argument about bad trade agreements, like NAFTA, particularly in the, uh, in the <coughs> Rust Belt. California, Oregon, and of course New York coming up uh, in two weeks, which I believe we're going to win. You of course have your own state of Pennsylvania, which I think we can win as, as well. Uh, the recent poll only shows Clinton up six points, which in Bernie land is essentially she's behind. Because every single state where Bernie has had time to talk to people and have these huge rallies and come back and visit and travel, he's either won or come, he's made up huge deficits. Nevada, we were 25 points down five weeks out. Now, if you're 25 points out five weeks out from election, you basically give up. But we came back, and by the way, we won the battle. At the end of the day, it's going to be like 2008. Bernie is actually going to win more delegates than Hillary Clinton, even though Hillary Clinton, on the day of the caucus itself, was declared the winner because Nevada has this, and other caucus states have this multi tier process. The caucus day only tells you how many delegates you then can send to the county convention. But you have to show up at the county convention. And all our people were much more enthusiastic because just a week ago, we overwhelmed their numbers in Clark County, which is where Las Vegas is, and we came out with many more delegates. So now we go to the state convention where the actual delegates are elected to the Democratic National Convention at the end of July. Bernie's going to have more delegates coming out of the back. I promise you that. Or you can call me up and say, you're a liar. It's just going to happen. Now, so now we're entering into a territory where we're, we can win lots of states. Now, I, I wasn't here for um, Jed's discussion, but the work you can do for the campaign is just really, really, really critical. And I, what I do for Bernie, I do for free. I, I travel all across the country. Some, I get my expenses paid, but I don't get a single dime, and I try to commit myself to do even more. And what I'm hoping you'll do is, those of you who are supporting Bernie, is if you agree to do one hour, Think about doing two hours. If you said you're going to volunteer one day until, when's the primary year? 26th of April, right? If you agree to one day, think about doing two days. Literally, <coughs> that kind of difference of doing a little extra is the difference between winning and losing. And all the calls that poured into Wisconsin, do you know Bernie was five or six points down about two weeks out? He won 71 out of 72 counties in Wisconsin. The only county that Clinton won by a slim margin was Milwaukee County. 71 out of 72 counties. And why did that happen? It was all about the field operation. It was all about the people knocking doors. I went one day to Kenosha, and those folks had knocked on 4,400 doors the day before. And it was weird weather. It was snow, squalls, it was just weird. 4,400 doors. And tons of people called into Wisconsin. That's why we won Wisconsin. That's why we won 71 out of 72 counties. So I really believe we're going to win this election. But we're going to have to work hard because we do have some uh, distance to make up. And the last thing I want to say is this is really what I said about an election of opportunity. It's also um, what excites me is that Bernie thinks big. You know, all the other candidates, get Republican for a second, but all of them, they're thinking just about keeping the status quo. We want to think big. Free college tuition for everybody who wants to go to a public university. Free health care like every other major industrialized country. Now, the people around the world think that's not thinking big. That's like logic. Like, why is America so stupid to waste so much money on health care? But all the things, what, what excites me, aside from, I, and I've, been, I've heard Bernie hundreds of times, he still moves me every single time partly because of who he is and his authenticity, but he always, when he talks about these big things, you don't hear people talking about big things. You know, nobody's calling on us, like, to, to reach the moon in, in, in one decade, as John F. Kennedy did. You know, if Hillary Clinton was alive when John F. Kennedy was giving that speech about reaching the moon, she would have said, oh, no, no, Mr. President, you can't do that. Don't think big about reaching the moon. And if 
She was alive, and Martin Luther King was saying, I have a dream. She said, no, no, Martin Luther King. Look, you're never going to get rid of racism. Just, you know, you know, stay in your place. And for those who march for marriage equality, right, which Hillary Clinton opposed for many, many years, she once gave a famous speech in the Senate floor that marriage was between a man and a woman. Same thing. She said, no, no, don't, don't try to think big. So we're about thinking big. And that's what excites you about the campaign. I hope that excites you, too. Thank you very much. understand uh, of looking into the Democratic Party, you know, in the past 50 years or so, is after George McGovern, I see that the Democratic Party has grown into a party that's kind of a, kind of scary. They're scared of <coughs> big ideas. They're scared of losing, which is why they use the electability argument. Oh, we need someone more center. We need this more someone who can win in a general election. So that's why I think that the Democratic Party is actually Bernie's biggest challenge. And I understand why Bernie went to the Democratic Party. I understand that he couldn't really run as a third candidate because that would split the vote. But I find that his biggest opposition comes not from the Republicans, but comes from people like Hillary, you know, politicians who think in a real liberal sense. And, and I just want, like, want, I'm wondering what's going on in his head when he thinks about that, because this, the Democratic Party is one that doesn't, inside movements to change it, and he's fundamentally trying to bring it back to a more FDR state. Yep. They oppose. They quash it because that doesn't win in their mind. So I'm trying to get into his head and think, how do you beat that? Because even if he wins the primary, even if he wins the election in November, you know, we still got to convince a lot of Democrats in the House that are currently there, unless we, you know, find some replacements for them, to get on board with his ideas yep. and to get on board with someone who just recently joined. So good question. That was a long way. Very good question. And by the way, I noticed your sweatshirt. Sweatshirt. I heard there was a basketball game. <laughs> Congratulations yeah. to the cast, by the way. I was, as I was telling people, I was in. Traveling from Bering, Wisconsin, I was in my hotel room Monday night in Milwaukee. Great, you know, fancy life. I lead a hotel right near the airport, the Hyatt Place. Brought some food in, had my feet up. I forgot there was a game. And I saw on the ticker, you know, I was watching, as, I'm a baseball fanatic, I don't really care about it. I was watching a baseball game, not even my team, just a baseball game, it's baseball season. And I saw the ticker, I flipped to the game, what a finish. That was like insane, insane. Anyway, back to politics. So, you articulated the challenge very, very well. And I think that Bernie, it's, you know, there's no easy answer to this. It's kind of complicated. And I think one of the challenges for us as involved um, activists is we have to think in somewhat complicated ways and sometimes contradictory ways. And here's what I mean. The Democratic Party is in many ways Another version, the Republican Party, in the way it is controlled by corporate interests. Bernie totally understands that. But I also think that it's fair to say that on a that we have to think about how do we do the political revolution that might take 10 years, but understand that in the daily lives of real people, there are differences between the two parties. So I'm a labor person. It does matter that we have a Democratic president because that person is going to select the head of the national race. National La Labor Relations Board, who is better than anybody the Republicans will put in, because the Republicans don't believe actually in unions. So along that way, and I, I think I'm articulating what Bernie, the way Bernie thinks, he understands that. Now, this is why he also said we need a political revolution, because I let's when we do elect him, unless we then understand that there's just this is just the beginning of the process, nothing is going to change, because they will defeat him and they will run him into the ground. So we have to have his back, and again, the reason I'm so, uh, I, I, I've never been more optimistic about our chances for political change than I, in my lifetime, actually. Um, and I think it's, even if we don't win, 
we, we're going to run, the, we're going to take control of the Democratic Party if we stick together. And if we continue to understand that we can fund our movement to the $27 average contribution, and if we continue to understand how to dialogue that has excited people. What I said on TV just now was, one of the reasons the Clinton campaign is basically run a fraudulent campaign is because Bernie, our political revolution, has defined the debate. And she has had to morph from a corporate moderate Democrat to call herself a progressive because she can't win any other way in the Democratic primary. She cannot win. And that's because every one of you was a Bernie supporter. We all define that debate, right? We define what it's going to be about, and that's why she has to copy all of Bernie's positions and then, of course, miscast what he's saying. So it is going to be a struggle, but I think he made the right choice. And there was a, there was a discussion about whether he should run as an independent, and he said no. He ultimately said no. Because you just can't win as an independent in this country. Whether you like it or not. And one thing, Bernie, going back to what I said before, one thing, Bernie, was very clear. And at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, if he's not the nominee, he will support the nominee, is he does not want to hand the, the election to the Republicans. Because he knows how devastating that would be. Did I answer? Mm -hmm. um, you have a question? Yes. Yeah, I had a comment and a question. The comment is that I'm. I'm <coughs> She was a Goldwater Republican. She was a young kid. I mean, I, I use that line sometimes too, but I, I don't necessarily care about what she was back then. But it's there's, it's uncontestable that the, the thing that was great about that debate was great. It wasn't such a great debate because it made John Lewis look like a fool. Yeah. But to the, it was foolish because the great thing about the civil rights movement involved millions of people, and the fact that he didn't see Bernie Sanders. <laughs> I, I mean. You know, I marched in, in probably every big demonstration in Europe against the Iraq war. And someday, if I ever ran for office, I would say, well, I didn't see Tassini in the, you know, well, there were a million people in the streets. Of course you didn't see me. It was just, it was just ludicrous. And that's how stupid he was. My question is, oh, I'm sorry, should, should, I thought you made a statement. Well, I was going to ask, question. Should, so should Bernie, would Bernie have, have um, been better off addressing that at that point? Instead of just, you know, No, what well, he did, I, I Look, I think that what he did was smart because the way you had to approach this was you weren't going to um, rub uh, John Lewis's nose in the ground. I mean, he is an icon. And particularly when at that point we were still, remember, this was pre Super Tuesday. And there was no way you wanted to have the African American population, which reveres him, feel like we were dissing him. And so the statements, and I, because I'm a surrogate, I read all of them, I get these talking points. Put them in a drop box and I read them. They were very careful. They said we really respect John L. Lewis. He personally suffered, you know, as we, we all know the story about how he was beaten up, you know, in the march to Selma. Um, and then he that, but then he just transferred it very sweetly and said, but Bernie was very active in the civil rights movement. He said it very much influenced him. And they talked about his record. It was it was done well. Any other questions, comments? Buy a book. Buy a book. Okay, we can do that at the end, but I want to make sure that everybody is cool, happy. Okay, yes, sir. Um, tell me your name. Uh, Marie. You had to think about that too long. <laughs> is that your real name? Okay. Just messing with you. Yeah, uh, it was said earlier by you, and then we want to hear it again. Uh, what, because I do, I just don't know much about Bernie Sanders. So, uh, what is the thing? 
30 years ago? Where did I come in in terms of this? The main principles that Bernie has stood for for as long as he's been in public life has been standing up for the regular person, um, believing that in the richest nation in human history, which is, which is what we are, we have more wealth than has ever been in any country. We have an obligation as a country to share that wealth. And I think that's the, mo the most important guiding principle to him. And of course, then related to that is democracy. One person, one vote, which is why, you probably heard this, why he's so obsessed, if I can use the word in a good way, about Citizens United. Are you familiar with Citizens United? So Citizens United, was a ruling by the Supreme Court that basically now allows billionaires and corporations to spend as much money as they want to buy our elections. And Bernie says that was one of the worst decisions that in the Supreme Court history in the last 30 years. And he has said that he will never nominate a Supreme Court justice to the Supreme Court, if that comes about during his tenure, who will not be permitted to overturn the Citizens United. Now that sounds kind of arcane, and, but it's all about our democracy. Because if we let the Koch brothers, who are billionaires, just buy our democracy, then our votes don't matter. <coughs> so that's very important. But I think the fundamental question is the, the fair use of our wealth. That everybody here deserves a fair share, that we should have free market. Then it gets into specifics about health care, and that we have an obligation to care for our people. And that we have lost our way in, in a certain way. And the statistics just bear it out. You know, the greatest gap between rich and poor that we've had in 50 years. You know, people with just obscene levels of wealth. People don't have good enough jobs. We've just been basically robbed. And I think Bernie's the best advocate for that. Did I kind of explain it like that? Okay. If you want, and, and if you go to the website, berniesanders.com, it's really intriguing. He, he has a good explanation of all the specific issues. But what drives him is standing up for the regular There is a, um, not a chapter about that, but there is, I believe it's under, and I should know this in which chapter, I, uh, I believe it's under personal liberty. Um, I have to remember where I put it, and I'll tell you why there's not a, a, a chapter. I wrote this before the campaign started. I wrote this book in 20 days, and I wrote it so it was done in July. Um, it's in here, we added it, I'm sorry I don't remember, but I That's where 
the controversy we came, and what they said, what the Clinton campaign expanded to say was, excuse me, Bernie Sanders um, cared more about, you know, chose the gun shop, gun owner, uh, the gun manufacturers over the Sandy Hook victims, and he made it so gross. You know, when it was a legitimate difference in policy, the last thing I'll say is, which is sometimes not come up, there is no chance, I believe, zero <coughs> chance, that that law would ever stand a test in the Supreme Court. And if you <coughs> have the law that said, this legal thing of guns, you're not going to hold people liable for something that somebody else does, there's no chance that that's going to, it's going to first of all be a fight for years. And my guess is that even some of the so-called liberal justices would vote against that because they would say it's a legal product. We can't actually hold somebody you know, under the law. You just want to look at the law. So I always thought, just practically speaking, this is not what Bernie says, I'm giving my own analysis, that it's totally foolish to spend God knows how much money lobbying for that and pushing it through, which it will never become law. What I think we should do is figure out how to get all the guns off the street and have actually sensible conversation that says the Second Amendment does not allow people to hold AK-47. You know, and have a real debate <coughs> about that and get as many guns in the, in the same way that I lived in Australia and they basically, after a massacre, they got rid of all guns, basically, more or less. I'm exaggerating a little bit. But to own a gun in Australia, uh, not just not to hunt in the bush, you have to, you have to have extraordinary permit for that. Like they go through a whole lot of things. You have to have, you have to have, be in a particular job. Not anybody can just walk in today and hold buy a gun. People don't have guns at home. No, it's it's all. It was one when I I lived there for two years recently, and there was one. Um, and I remember mass killing when some a little bit of a, a crazy person had a gun and two hostages in a cafe in downtown Sydney. And I think there were a couple of people killed in that. But aside from that, nothing. Bernie Sanders says that the National Rifle Association gives him a D minus on gun issues. Yeah, that's right. A D minus. That's just, that is a fact. 